I would consider almost every day that I was in the pool a series of small failures that I could iterate on to lead to a larger successful outcome. I, I don't think I truly made any breakthroughs without it being sort of a failure, whether you know, tweaking my technique, uh, um, you know, improving my stra race strategy, so on and so forth. Like it was always, a, you know, seeking improvement which means I was currently doing something suboptimally. This is The Practical Optimist, a podcast that explores the intersection of leadership and life. I'm your host, Ken Schmidt, founder and CEO of Turning Point Executive Search and author of The Practical Optimist, an entrepreneur's journey through life's turning points. Thanks again for being with us. You can subscribe wherever you get your podcasts. And as always, please tell all your friends all about us. Believe it or not, we have a triple threat with us today. Not only is our guest an Olympic medalist, not only is he a former Navy SEAL, but he's also a venture capitalist based here in San Diego, where he founded Harpoon Ventures back in 2018. Today, we're joined by Larson Jensen, who will talk to us about embracing the feeling of discomfort in your career, about the need to fail again and again if you want to be truly successful, and how incredibly important it is to develop a sense of self-awareness. So pull up a chair, get your pens and paper ready to take some notes, and listen to my conversation with Larson as he discusses the intersection of leadership and life. So I'm very glad to have you with us here on the uh, podcast, Larson. Thank you for joining us. Um, I'm joined today by Larson Jensen, who's also here in San Diego, and he is the founder and managing partner at Harpoon Ventures. So thank you for joining us today. Hey, my pleasure, Ken. Thanks for having me. I'm really looking forward to it. And we have a lot of good stuff to talk to uh, and kind of get to. First and foremost is, you know, congrats on the on the upcoming birth of your third child. That's very exciting news. Yeah, we're really excited. Coming up any day now, we already have two little, uh, you know, I say this in all endearing ways, two little monster little boys who are playing with, you know, Marvel superheroes and got lightsabers and all that stuff for Christmas. So they're they're a bundle of energy, but we're looking for our princess who's coming here any day now. So that's great. Really excited. Well, she'll be lucky to have two uh, big brothers to uh, take care yeah, of. Yeah, right? totally. <laughs> like yeah, dad. <laughs> yeah, they, yeah. Anybody that uh, wants to date her in the future better watch out because these exactly. little boys are serious. Yeah, they're going to have to go through you and two brothers. That's going to oh, be. Oh man, <laughs> I, I don't envy them. Yeah, for sure. Exactly right. Well, congrats. That's very exciting news. Look Thank forward you. to seeing the, seeing the pictures for sure. So we want to we want to talk about obviously a handful of things today, and as you know, our podcast, the uh, the Practical Optimist, is all about you know blending kind of leadership and life. So talking about kind of the different decisions that you've made uh, in your career, but also on the personal side as well. Uh, and these days, everybody knows that you know when you when you come to work, whether you're an employee or whether you're an intern or whether you're a CEO, uh, you come to work as a whole person. Right. And you've got to be willing to share that and not just be an employee number, right, or a number on a spreadsheet, but really have a true, you know, kind of kind of personality and life behind that number as well. And that's really kind of the focus that we have in the podcast here. So I want to start with, you know, your background is obviously very interesting and, and you've done some phenomenal work there, um, both professionally and personally. But let's start with, you know, so obviously you are an Olympics swimmer, right? Let's talk about that. I was. I'm, I'm yeah. curious, what what got you into swimming in the first place? Why why that sport when you were, you know, a young <laughs> a young schooler out there, uh, you know, student? Yeah. Uh, yeah. How's yeah. swimming? I happen to dive into that. So I guess for some more context, I grew up in the Central Valley of California. I actually grew up on an almond farm on the outskirts of Shafter and Wasco, California, which is about 30 minutes outside of Bakersfield, California. So both my house and my elementary school growing up had almond orchards on three sides, a road and an almond orchard on the other side. So definitely a, a rural upbringing. Um, and in my younger years, during my you know, K through eight, we had about 30 people in the class maximum throughout that entire, uh, that, that entirely, entire early education. Um, but I guess fortunately for me, it gets rather hot in the Central Valley of California during the summer around the time they're harvesting almonds. <laughs> and so, um, you know, it's pretty routine for folks to have backyard pools and things of that nature. So um, in my younger years, I definitely grew up in and out of the pool in the summer, spending, you know, all day until, Literally, the bottoms of my feet were raw and would have, you know, practically speaking, blood blisters on them because the concrete is so hot. <laughs> uh, but then join the join the swim team in my younger years, and you know, very similar to my own kids here, you know, did soccer and t ball and baseball and flag football and all of those things. 
Um, but was fortunate to find swimming in my, in my younger years, you know, at the encouragement of my mom. Um, and you know, I remember being pretty embarrassed about it because you know, swimming is a very revealing sport, especially for a young man to wear a speedo every day. So I remember <laughs> having a lot of, uh, you know, a, a lot of hesitation around joining the swim team because I didn't want to wear something so skimpy. Sure. Um, but, but, but as things go, got, got used to it and, Sort of developing that that talent and that skill set over time, and um, you know, ultimately learn. I think it was my first real experience where I saw you know a very direct correlation between hard work in and performance out, and it's a lesson mm-hmm. that I've taken with me throughout the rest of my life. And I think it's an easy concept to grasp. Um, but ultimately, in swimming, it's one of those sports where very routinely you do two practices a day. Uh, as swimmers get more serious about it generally in the high school time frame uh 5 a.m workouts are very common and for us that meant having to leave the house at 4 30 to get there on time well you got to be really committed and, to whatever sport or activity yeah. you're doing to get up and get out of the house at 4 yeah totally and, and, and all my respect goes to my parents for for going through that because it's not just the athlete that's doing it it's the enablement and the you know and the parenting that really helped uh, you know put sure, the, sure. the children in a position to have that success in the first place uh, but ended up, ended up, you know, maturing that talent in my younger years out in Bakersfield, California, and ultimately, you know, traveled down to USC where I got a scholarship to to swim there, and was fortunate to make it to two Olympic Games in 2004 and 2008. And during that time in the swimming, yeah, it's always competitive, but during a, t- a point in time where Michael Phelps is winning, you know, six gold medals at one Olympics and eight gold <laughs> medals at the next, the, the bar is particularly high. And so I, I had the you know lucky experience to, you know, swim with teammates like that, um, who really helped to push everybody to the next level, myself included. And so in 2004 is when I received a silver medal in the uh, 1500 freestyle and 2008 is when I received the bronze medal in the 400 freestyle. And both are tremendous experiences and very different in a lot of different ways to go to the birthplace of the modern Olympics in 04 and to go to you know China, which is you know really uh, going through a resurgence on a global scale. And that really being sort of the, the launching off point for them in terms of like sure, what sure. they've been doing, especially economically recently, uh, was really a great experience. And you know, led to some great insights that helped me, you know, in, in other, in other career areas as I moved on from swimming. Yeah. Yeah. It's interesting. I mean, so we, we spoke to, I don't know if you know, Sharon Spooler, but she is a managing uh, partner actually with chief outsiders also here in San Diego. And I bring it up because we were talking to her about her coming up and she went to uh, Princeton and was started off playing basketball and then moved over to track and field as a javelin yeah. thrower. And it was interesting conversation because I said, you know, I always picture track and field as, aside from relaying, you know, as being a very individualistic sport, right? It's not like a, on the court in basketball, obviously it's a t- very much a team yeah. sport. Uh, and I'm, I'm kind of curious about swimming in my mind, not, you know, being, obviously not knowing much about it at all. I would think that swimming would also be a very individualistic sport as opposed to being, you know, relying on other folks. Is that true? Is that, did you get that yeah, that more yeah. team or not? Uh, yeah, I mean, I think that uh, at, at surface level, I agree with that. However, it's like anything else in life, you know, whether it be raising kids or starting a business or just, you know, being somebody who's, uh, you know, a high profile, uh, uh, high performer in the work context. Mm-hmm. For any accomplishment, there's a mountain of support that happens in the back end. And so I think sort of traditionally speaking, yeah, it's more of an individual contributor type of a uh, sport. But I mentioned you know earlier that there's zero chance, you know, before I had my driver's license, I'd have the opportunity to go to the swimming pool and have the opportunity <laughs> to work in the morning and try and put in the yardage if it wasn't for my family that helped me do that. Uh, it wasn't just me there. It was my coaches. It was my teammates um, as well that helped to, to push me along. And so although I think it, it can be a very lonely sport and it is you know, described as sort of an individual contributor or an individual type of sport, there's a whole team and a whole mountain of support that goes into it. And so sure. um, I don't think any athlete would, would accomplish much regardless of whether it's a, you know, a traditional team-based sport like football or baseball or soccer um, or something that's, you know, I guess generally viewed as an individual type of sport without that support basis. So I don't really think there's too many sports out there that don't require that unless it's something that Good point. Yeah, I, I mean, I think most sports are are team based, in my my yeah. opinion. And I think it's so it's important to look at it that way, in my opinion. 
Yeah, exactly. And again, the same, same as in the professional world also. You might be yeah, in a role yeah. that you're an accountant or you're a warehouse manager or you're you know, in sales or whatever. And the job itself may be you know, one-on-one with your clients or your particular you know, function. But at the same time, it's, it is a team effort. You've got to rely on and, and work with and collaborate with those around you. Otherwise, you can't do your job effectively, no matter how individual the day-to-day tasks may be. Totally. I mean, the biggest recipe for disaster and everything that I've ever seen is the the folks that think that it's them against the world with no enablement from anybody else. <laughs> you're doomed to failure. Like as, as good as you might be, um, you're going to fail. Yeah. Well, that's what we, it's that cliche, right? All the CEOs and leaders that you hear about out there when they're being interviewed, and they talk about I, 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 and there's never a we. Uh, right. It's just, you know, or, or it's they when something goes wrong, right? They did this, totally. they did that. Yeah. And yet I did all the great stuff. It's just, you know, that's <laughs> that's a recipe for for leadership disaster, to say the least. Couldn't agree more. No. Yeah. So so you so you parlayed that experience, obviously, and then got out of school, you know, did the the two stints at the Olympics, which is amazing, and winning those those two uh the, the silver and the bronze. So then you decided to go the the way of the military, right? And you moved into becoming a Navy SEAL, which is <laughs> no no small you know step by any stretch of the imagination. H- how did you make that decision? Why did you go that route versus you know getting into a corporate role uh, at that point? Yeah, that was a really interesting time in my life, and um, I think during that time is uh, there's so many things that go into it. To say it's any one thing more sure, than other sure. is is overly simplistic. But ultimately, it, during my time in sports, I had the opportunity to push myself you know, individually and with my teammates as hard as I possibly could. But really, you know, was seeking out that to the next level, the opportunity to push myself physically, mentally, uh-huh, uh-huh. emotionally, and just truly see what I'm made out of. And I think without those crucibles in life, you, you can sometimes be left guessing. Like, do I have more in the tank? Where is my limit? And a lot of people I don't think have, have, have the opportunity to find that. I think I found it in the swimming pool, but was really trying to find it in a new career field and in uh-huh. a way that is more multifaceted. And I also was really craving for more of that mutual dependency, that teamwork, that camaraderie, where um, literally my life was in other people's hands, and the the inverse the case as well. And so, uh, and then you know, finally, I, I felt very fortunate to have the opportunity to compete on the international stage, mm-hmm. um, wearing red, white, and blue on my back and on my swimsuit, and et cetera. Um, and I was fortunate to have that opportunity and wanted to give back in some capacity. And uh, I'm a firm believer that service in any capacity is a noble, noble pursuit. And for me, if I felt that I had the mental and physical fortitude to do it at that level, that I should, I should go pursue that. So it was a variety of things that I think led me to that decision. And frankly, are probably pretty similar to almost anybody who, who joins the SEAL teams or joins the military, broadly speaking. Um, I, I remember when I went into the LA recruiting depot uh, to, you know, go, you know, put my proposal together for mm-hmm, mm-hmm. joining the SEAL teams. One of the things they ask you to do is write down your top, I believe it was six to eight choices of, you know, what you'd want to do in, in the Navy in this case. Oh, wow. um, they said, they said, so, Hey, you know, Larson, fill out your top six choices of things you want to do. And we'll see if there's a fit for any of those things. And I wrote down, you know, SEAL teams for each and every one of those choices. And they you know, kindly informed me, like, "Hey, young man, this is you know not how this goes. This is the military. You get you know get all the choices in the world and all of that stuff." And I said, "Well, this is this is my choice, and I'm going to the SEAL teams, hell or high water." You know, upon reflection on that, you know, on, on one hand, that's sort of like young and egotistical and <laughs> right. to, to go do. But on the other hand, you know, having the opportunity to work with some you know people that are way braver than I will ever be, you know, way tougher than I will ever be in the SEAL teams. I definitely think that that's the only way. And it should, in hindsight, be a selection criterion of itself. If you write down things in terms of how you're hedging your bets and or would be okay doing anything else, then you're not a good fit for the community, in my estimation. And I think most people would agree with that. And and, and did you have anybody in your family that was military as well? Had you had any exposure or familiarity with it at all? Uh, a little bit. My my dad was in the in the army years ago, uh, but never was something that he imposed on me. It was rarely talked about, uh, and it was something that I think I, I sort of like came to my own conclusions on. Uh, I'm sure that the family upbringing was part of it, um, mm-hmm. but um, yeah, not not very directly, if I remember correctly. Interesting. Wow. Okay. Great. And, and so you did uh, four years. 
I did six years in the SEAL team. Six. Okay, so gotcha, yeah, gotcha, yeah. Gotcha. Okay. deployed to Afghanistan, my second one to Southeast Asia. Um, oh. And then, you know, ended up getting married to my college sweetheart and uh, you know, <laughs> priorities change and evolve. Like life right, exactly, is dynamic, yes. you know, as we were talking last time, very yep. rarely do people stay, you know, as they traditionally did in the same role at the same company for an entire lifetime. Right. People evolve and they change what they want to do as a career pursuit. And, you know, I, I think, you know, my, my transition from, swimming into the Navy, I think gave me the opportunity to understand what it's like to reinvent yourself. Mm -hmm, And mm -hmm, what's really nice about that transition in hindsight was that they have a process where they, you know, take you through the gauntlet, literally, uh, (laughs) and you sort of like emerge out of the other end, if you're so lucky to, uh, to being a contributing member of the community. Um, But I think what it taught me most, most importantly, was the ability to humble myself in the face of a career pursuit. Mm -hmm. That Yeah, I was really good at something in a prior career, but I was starting something, you know, cleanly all over again. Uh, There's no possible way to go from whatever you're doing pre military or pre SEAL teams to being, you know, in the SEAL teams, you have to go through the process and you have to humble yourself. And I think, a lot of folks that I saw, you know, who were, were looking to make that tran- that career transition struggled with it, um, who weren't sure, able to sure. humble themselves and take that until take that healthy dose of cri- criticism uh, to figure out how to improve and how to fit in and how to be a contributing member of this new this new career. And yeah, so mm-hmm. I, I took those lessons I learned there uh, in a much more ambiguous environment into my next career after the military. And I, I think I was better positioned for it, I, yeah, arguably. That, and, and, and I have a lot of colleagues also who are friends of mine who, you know, their first real career was was joining the military. And I think they're, you know, in my opinion, learning that lesson again, uh, freshly, you know, they're, mm-hmm, new. Mm-hmm. Uh, they'd never been through a career transition before joining the military in most cases. And so right, right. Uh, having, to, having to eat that piece of humble pie as, you know, they get out and find something new for the first time. Well, I, I know for me, you know, I I didn't know exactly what industry I was going to get into, but I knew as a teenager that I wanted to have my own business. I knew that I was better, you know, kind of out in front of people, if you will, versus being behind the desk. That was kind of my strength was being out uh, and, and being with folks and, and talking and and strategizing those kind of things. But I had no idea how that would manifest, you know, down the road in, in a, in a uh, professional career. Did you, when you were going through high school and when you were swimming, did you... Did you foresee kind of where you wanted to end up or was each stage kind of its own microcosm, if you will, and was kind of, you know, contained what they were within, but didn't really, you didn't really think much about what was going to be the next step after that? Yeah, I, I think more of the latter, each stage was sort of self-contained and okay. contained. And I was uh-huh. very focused on that initial you know thing that I was doing. Um, you know, when I joined the military, I don't think I had any preconceptions on whether or not I'd stay in for a career or not. I mean, it was informed based on people I talked to and people that went before. And I saw, you know, certainly I was aware of people who left the military to do other things, but, you know, to be honest, I didn't expect myself to, you know, leave after six years. I didn't, I don't know for sure if I ever expected to do 20, sure, um, sure. but you know, there's an old saying that no battle plan survives first contact with the enemy, meaning you can plan all day with the whiteboard and think, you know, what's <laughs> going to happen. But the second you st- you step off and, you know, the enemy or, or in the private sector case, the, you know, the market has other ideas and right. opportunity, you know, and, and options and you have to be able and family comes up and obviously life is not linear and it's not simple. I think one of the things that I've learned is to just sort of like listen to those signals and adapt what I do and have and be comfortable with that, be comfortable recognizing when I make a decision that just because I make a decision to do something doesn't mean it's the final decision. It doesn't need right. to be the final thing, you know, the, the thing that and, and factors know, around change. may change. Yeah. As, totally. As it the changes. expression it goes, changes. right. You know, life is what happens when you're making plans. <laughs> so. exactly. that's, that's, I like that one. I'm going to steal that one from you, Kim. <laughs> I wish I remember where I heard it from, but yeah, it's, I mean, it's yeah. so true. You, like you said, you can have the best intentions and you can plan things out and model 10 different scenarios only to come to find out once you get into it that hey things are very different you can't you yeah. can't account for every potential decision out there and everybody else is trying to make their own decisions as well which is just as fluid as yours is I, I agree I agree yeah. and I think where, where I did that the worst uh, was you know after business school there's a whole it, it's sort of similar with business school almost everybody in a, in, a, in a class is trying to find their next gig thereafter and there's a lot of pressure that I think is just in that microcosm of everyone everyone doing it at the same time 
And one thing that, you know, I got caught up in that as well. And if I can go back and give myself, uh, my former self advice, I would say something along the lines of, you know, just don't make a bad decision. Who cares if you make the perfect decision? Just right. don't make a bad one. And when you think about it, there's very few things that are truly bad. Like just, uh, you know, don't become an addict. Don't work with, you know, right, yeah, you know, yeah. All those, like, follow your decisions. values yeah. and have yeah, a moral exactly. compass. Right. But, but, but other than that, like just go work with people that are generally more talented than you, smarter mm-hmm. than you, better connected than you. And if I, that's what I would have told myself back then. And I think it takes a lot of the pressure and the edge off of that right, versus right. the philosophy of like, am I going to love this for the rest of eternity? At the end of the day, you know, choosing a job is very different than choosing a spouse. Um, right. you know, choosing a spouse and choosing, you know, my, you know, my wife is a commitment for a lifetime, but choosing a job isn't like, you right. know, there's no, va- there's no vows before God that I'm taking to a prospective <laughs> exactly. employer or a, cor- or a career field. And, <laughs> yeah. and so I think, you know, treating it with the same level of seriousness, I think is right. misguided in my mm-hmm. opinion. Um, and for a point in time, I was treating it with a very similar, you know, yardstick. Mm-hmm, and mm-hmm. ultimately, I think just being comfortable in a you know dynamic work environment and you know economic environment is, um, I think, is what has allowed me and some other folks I work with to iterate and improve and constantly you know throw things out that we previously thought were good ideas that ended up being bad, right? True, and true. Du- double down on things that you know previously we thought were bad ideas that ended up being good. And so I just right. uh, having that sort of like open mind about opportunity, I think, is is pretty important in job seeking. Yeah, and I think that's a really good point you bring up. And I think also having an open mind about you know the the allowing yourself right, giving you giving yourself that that uh, lead you know, kind of leeway, if you will, to make mistakes. And to know oh. that, you know, you're, you, 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 a, you know, with more time, you have a better, you have a better screening process, right? A better filter. And you're able to, to cut out all the bullshit that you hear. When you hear something at 22, it, it lands very differently than when you're 32 or 42, right? Yeah. Um, but the, you, you can't do anything about that. You, you can't really accelerate that. It's just a matter of your, your, your gut instinct. Yeah, um, adjusts and changes and improves over time as you've been burned or as you have had good yeah. experiences in, in those 20 years. There's no way to get around that. So giving yourself yeah. that leeway and, and to say, hey, I'm going to make mistakes on the career side. I'm going to do one thing that sounds great and realize a year later, oh, wow, this is not the right environment for me or I was yeah. I was sold a, 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 you know, a bill of goods kind of thing. Totally agree. And I think w- one of the other things is I was like job seeking post MBA um, I remember at the time a lot of a lot of precedents being put on career progression and like is there upper mobility inside of the given firm or company right, right. Or, or or ladder mobility and all those things. And now as we you know I started something more entrepreneurial in our in our own thing, like I have the same types of questions from mm-hmm. you know potential new hires and want right. to career career progression and all those things. Uh, and it's really challenging because you know. It, the answer is like who knows? Like who knows? Like it, there's no guarantees. A, it, there's you, you, no guarantees. Yeah, there's right. no guarantee. Like when I was seeking out in the first place, and at the at the time, like now I, I have the opportunity to walk a mile in somebody else's shoes, right? My former people right, that were offering right. me a job previously, or I was trying to get a job with. I mean, their their realistic answer should have been who knows? Like I don't know if you're any good at what you do, and like right. if you do a good job, sure you can you know go up or try sure. to start something else or what have you. It's sort of like an obvious thing to say, but you know, internalizing it at the, at that point in time was yeah. not very clear for me. And I put a lot of, you know, too much overthinking. I could say like, Oh, is there going to be upper mobility here versus just some yeah. self-confidence that if I do a good job, good, op- good things will happen. Right. And I right. think that, 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 uh, Self-confidence in uncertainty is something that I underestimated in, in terms of importance. And it's you can't predict what the future holds. You never know what's going to happen or the mm-hmm. opportunities are right around the corner. And that's why I sort of like come to the conclusion of, you know, in hindsight, just swimming with folks like Mike, Michael Phelps and other Olympians and great coaches. Like, I don't know exactly what's going to happen here, but good things should occur. So right. It's sort of obvious to say. Chances you know, are. Go, yeah. Chances are. Go, go, right. and, and joining the military, go work with people that are more motivated and hungrier and tougher and, you know, braver. Like that's going to rub off. Like, and hopefully right. that could be a core, you know, a key component of that. 
And similarly now in terms of like the work, you know, the work that we're doing in venture capital, the work with people that have, you know, been around through multiple cycles, have been very successful, founders that are very driven and have created businesses previously. And there's no guarantees that all of these things are going to work out perfectly, but directionally we're, you know, we're working up on, on that level now. And so I think it's a very simple equation, but also nerve wracking at the same time, especially for somebody that wants some, you know, a high degree of clarity on what's next in the years and months ahead. You know, it's, it's sort of that philosophy of being comfortable, being uncomfortable that I think is really, right. you know, uh, you know, if I, again, going back to giving my former self advice, uh, I would just say to lean on that as being sort of the North star. Yeah, no, that's, that's very, very well said. And I think you know, one of the things I talk about in my book also is how, you, you need to have the, the, that value of foundation of, and values from the get go. And it's going to evolve. You're going to you're going to add more values as, as you have more experiences over the course of your life and career. Right. Um, but if you don't have that North Star, if you don't know what you're what you're driving towards or what's going to keep you um, uh, grounded in really difficult times, then you're going to be lost. It's really easy to stick to your values when times are good. Right. Um, totally. How hard can that be? The challenge is, yeah. you know, am I really willing to give things up or sacrifice things or say no to a job? You know, if it doesn't align with my values, I'm not I'm not going to do this. Or we have examples in our in recruiting, of course, of companies call us and say, hey, we want you to h- help us hire whatever a VP of sales. And we know as, as recruiters with you know, a lot of experience, that company has a very bad reputation. Right. They yeah. churn through people. They over promise. They under deliver. They, they really you know browbeat their people out there. Could we take on the search and get the revenue? Sure, but not in good conscience, right? We know what our values are. We know what guides us, and we're not going to take we're not going to take a bad client that's going to that's going to put a candidate in a bad situation just because we want the transaction and the commission. So you've got to have that value system in place uh, throughout your career, so you know what to go back to when times get tough. Totally, and it it seems like an easy thing to say. Right, right. It It seems so obvious, but it's actually harder than you might might imagine. You know, short term thinking versus long term thinking, especially when it comes down to putting food on the table. Right, it's super easy. I imagine for you, like taking on a search, like I I don't know, like depending on the market environment, especially when you're getting started, like it's probably pretty easy to say yes to things that maybe aren't in the best interest of the long term nature of your company and your firm. Same with us, right? It's, It's like having the you know and being prepared to. Like nothing is a is a, is really a decision unless there's trade offs, right? And you need to be make sure that you take the long term trade offs. In my opinion, ten out of ten times, and right, you know, think right. about like what what does that near term decision do to set you up for success five or ten years from now, not you know five or ten weeks from now. Right. Yeah. Exactly. Having that longer term and 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 allowing yourself and being in an environment that also allows for that longer term mindset. I mean, that's the thing about whether you're a public company or pre-IPO or whatever, you know, it's really tough when you are being governed by what's happening this month, this quarter, this fiscal year, right? It's hard to have that long-term mentality. You're on one hand being told, focus on the numbers today, but also keep in mind the long-term. Well, it's really hard to have it both ways, right? And you're you're in an industry now where, you know, seven out of, I mean, you know, across the board, seven out of 10 investments don't do well, right? So you're That's looking right. for those three that really can, can keep you popped, you know, propped up um, and help pop those revenues as well longer term. That's tough when you have when you have that built in you know level, if you will, of of accepted failure for lack of a better term. Yeah. How do you know what those three good ones are going to be? It's tough. So so speaking of that, so, yeah. you, so you got into venture capital, right? So you started with right. one of the, the biggest firms in the world at Andreessen Horowitz, right? As as an intern, I believe, correct? I the, was, yeah, I uh, was. Uh, my mentality is if I show up and clean the toilets, like yeah, at least I'll get <laughs> to know the right people and hopefully learn some things. Again, good so, things are going right, to happen. Yeah. Yeah, right. Exactly. Yeah. Wow, that's that's phenomenal. So, so when you got into it, was it was it um, was it different than what you expected? Was it eye opening? You thought, oh wow, this is not as glamorous as I have read about, or was it kind of what you expected? Oh, man, as, uh, as an industry, tough. not 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 just that firm, but as an industry. Yeah. As an industry, I, I would say that there's nothing that I've been ever been a part of that. Um, I think the media overly make things dramatic. Yes, um, yes. overly glamorizes things. And I think the reality, whether that be, it's it sort of obvious that no one wants to read about the day in and day out grind of, you know, showing up at four 30 or five o'clock in the morning. Everyone wants to read about like the, you know, see the metal stand. That's when people, the photos are taken. Right. The photos and the reports are not taken, you know, before the majority of the world is up. Same thing in the SEAL teams, you know, there's mm-hmm. plenty plenty written out there about the successful operations or what have you, or the good things that have happened or or the things that are, you know, clickbait worthy. But 
the <laughs> real work is done behind the scenes. And I'd say the same thing in the venture capital ecosystem. There's a whole lot talking about valuation, successful funding rounds, IPOs, et cetera. But really behind all of that is just a mountain of hard work and tough decisions and difficult conversations. Um, and I, that's where that's where the work's really done. Mm-hmm, uh, mm-hmm. I, I think just across society, I, I, I can't think of a single example where people don't cherry pick those few, you know, glimmers of, you know, either good things or bad things and, and overcorrect one way or another. And nice. so I'd say that the behind the scenes is very similar to other things that I, I've been fortunate to be a part of. And it's a lot of hard work, mm-hmm. a lot of analysis, a lot of repre- uh, uh, reputation building, sure, yeah. um, a lot of, you know, just competition, frankly. Um but out of that, it, it is really interesting to consider as a career field and, and sort of imply that rubric to individual job seeking as well. And you hit on it a little bit earlier where venture capital is a really unique business where the number of your failures literally doesn't matter. It's purely the magnitude of winners. Wow. Like how big, how, yeah. how big is the success? Uh, not how many failures you have. And uh, you know, said differently, when in most traditional or high profile venture capital firms, they expect roughly a third of the deals to lose all their money. So mm-hmm. zeros, uh, roughly a third of them to um, return money, 1x roughly. Right. And, and then that last third to you know return a meaningful multiple with only a couple in any given fund doing really, really well. Wow. And the best, per- best performing funds have, you know, 50 plus X multiples on a few positions, which really return the fund multiple times over. And so I, I think that's really eye opening to me as, as you know, uh, I've thought about opportunities, not only from an investment context, um, but also in a personal context and being willing to, to fail and mm-hmm. being okay with that, being right. okay with being not only wrong, but drastically wrong and making <laughs> and making decisions based on the concept where like, uh, if this works, it could be a very large outcome, but recognizing that, you know, the market gets a vote, that competitors are going to pop up, things are going to happen. Mm-hmm. And a lot of times you're going to be just outright wrong and being mm-hmm, comfortable mm-hmm. with that. And so I think what's really interesting in terms of the concept of risk from an investment standpoint, just like a professional context, most people view risk as as negative, as a bad thing. Mm-hmm. And I think I've grown to appreciate risk as being neither good nor bad. It's you know just sort of like a state of almost equilibrium in many mm-hmm. ways where – Risk can be bad, but risk can also be very, very good. It's all a question of how you mitigate that risk and how you understand what the opportunity is inherent with that risk. There's risks that can help you, that can not help you, that can lead you to losing all of your money. There's right. risks that can lead you to making a 50x return on, mm-hmm. on your money. And similarly, I would say with with career decisions and things that people decide to do, um, the old analogy, there's no free lunch. If you join something where there's very low risk, meaning there's no downside. There's likely no upside as well. Right, and exactly. so I think that when, when thinking about opportunities in terms of you know starting something new, joining something new that's unproven, and us, for an example, we're a newer firm. We're, mm-hmm, we're only mm-hmm. five years old. Arguably, we're a risky thing for somebody to join. Um, in the sense that you know we haven't been around as long as these firms that have been around for decades. Sure, sure. But I would say if you go to, you know, another way to think about risk is opportunity cost. You go to a firm that's been around for decades, there's likely less opportunity for, you know, rapid expansion in the role because there's more clear, like, delineation of expectations. Here we have very uh, fluid uh, (laughs) expectations. And if you, you know, do things that are outside the box that lead to out, you know, outsized growth, then we're happy to, you know, compensate and promote and all Mm -hmm. those types of things with no, you know, on an ad hoc basis, any given day, any given second, we're happy to do that. There's no, you know, clear, um, you know, annual reviews and things like that. Like there might be at a more established company, um, but that you know also comes out of trade off because it's higher stress in many ways. Uh, the future is less certain. What we expect is dynamic and changes mm-hmm, day mm-hmm. to day, hour to hour. Um, and so there's there's trade offs there, and, and neither is right nor wrong. It's just. You know, overlaying, as you mentioned, your personal values, your family situation, right. your career aspirations with, you know, your 
age, your whatever, all those mm-hmm. things come into account. And it's not, it's not a simple decision, but I think for me and for us, I, I think it's, I love it. I, I love this, uh, this opportunity. Um, but it could all evaporate in an instance, but I sure, think that's sure. what keeps us, keeps us paranoid and keeps us on <laughs> edge and, and hopefully keeps us, you know, pushing the performance boundaries. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, it's funny. I mean, I, I, there's a chapter in my book, I talk about, you know, perseverance and resilience, right? And as I, as I you know, kind of, I've, I've kind of reflected on my career being an entrepreneur, being a business owner, being, you know, a CEO, all the things that we've done, um, but also in terms of my family side too. And there are things that hit you that are totally out of the blue that you can, you can there's no way you can anticipate, right? You just, you just can't plan yep. for it. Uh, and other things that you can plan for. And so you're prepared, hopefully for the worst case and, but hopefully the best case, you know, comes up, but I always come back to being, being resilient, and being and, and being able to persevere through tough times and resilience is all about how do you bounce back? Why why do you go yep. back and do the same thing again? You know when when it's already hit you in the face and it's been a really really difficult time. And then how do you persevere? How do you push through a time that is just a, a pain in the ass, really difficult, just yeah. gut wrenching? How do you push through that? Right. Um, I'm I'm curious if that comes to mind for you in in terms of what you do, but also yeah. when you're when you're hiring people or when you're deciding you know which um you know what what investments to make, do you talk about do you think about perseverance and resilience uh, in the normal normal course of your of your day? Uh, every day, every day <laughs> is resilience and perseverance. Perseverance, and I think just anecdotally, uh, being comfortable hearing no mm-hmm, mm-hmm. virtually right. all day every day right. and. <laughs> It's just the reality of things. And like for us, when we raise money from, you know, investors into our fund, um, we hear no a lot. Uh, We hear no a lot when we try to make our own investments, you know, to, and we, we lose a lot. And, but taking those data points, iterating, improving, putting ourselves in a better position every single day based on market feedback, uh, based on the feedback we get from individuals, I think is how we really build an enduring franchise. And I think the real, Balance is like knowing when it's time to cut bait, um, right. being comfortable saying, hey, it's clear we've seen no on this, despite our iterations and our improvements of our messaging, our product or whatever, like no means no, right? And so, and it's, it's challenging with some of the investments we make where, you know, we, we've, you know, we've had companies go bankrupt and that's, you know, a, a sure, very sad sure. thing, especially when there's like, you know, 50, 100 people on the payroll there, it's right, not just yeah. us as investors. It's like, you know, the people that were working there and they have to find new jobs and all of that. And it the customers their lives they dramatically, have. right? Totally. It's really, really a challenge. And everybody had the right intentions and the business model appeared to be legitimate, right? And, and sound totally. in the beginning. But for whatever reason, it's just, the market changes around you or a competitor comes in or whatever happens. Yeah, exactly. And, you know, so things are dynamic and they change. And so I think the challenge is, you know, uh, reprioritizing resources, you know, and resources could be mental bandwidth. They could be capital. They could be, you know, human capital. They could be any of these things based on the realities of what you're saying. And I think there's a different, like, you know, everything has a negative connotation. Persistence and all of that (laughs) can also be a negative, right? Right, It it could be, you know, stubbornness and Mm -hmm. a total uh, lack of (laughs) self-awareness to understand market realities. But I tend to think that, you know, in, in my observation, people tend to, uh, I think, throw in the towels just a, slightly too early by mm-hmm, and large. Mm-hmm. I'm, I'm painting with a very broad brush. Sure. Um, you know, because they're, it, not, they're it, not willing to go through the difficult time. And so they they are they decide, well, it's just too hard. It's not going to work. Getting no sucks. Getting yeah. no sucks. Getting rejected sucks. Like, it's right. not easy. It's it's literally failure. Like, yeah. it, is, it, right. it literally is. It's, it's literally failure time after time. And there's only, you know, resilience helps you get through that. But I think you need the perspective to know like when, you know, when are you operating with rose colored glasses mm-hmm, in spite mm-hmm. of like overwhelming information right. and that self-awareness is really important. But um, people, I think, I think really struggle myself included with, re- with rejection. Mm-hmm. And I think st- stealing yeah. your, you know, I like, like stealing like your soul to reject. <laughs> I, I think it's just like yeah. a true skill set because with, I think the only real failure you can have is if you get rejection and you don't understand like the real authentic reason for why that mm-hmm. rejection occurred is is really the only time where you can fail. If you get rejected, sure. but you understand exactly why, mm-hmm. and better yet, if you're in a position to back channel, because no, very and, rarely and learn from it and, and, and apply those it. lessons. Yeah, and next learn time from around. it. Rarely does somebody give you an honest answer for why the answer is no. 
Like you think back to it, like, you know, whether it be in the early day, you know, days of dating or whatever, but, oh, it's just right. not a fit. Now with like us investing. <laughs> it's or not me. Investing, it's, oh, yeah. It's, yeah, right. yeah. It's not me. Yeah, it's, it's, not it's not you. It's, it's me. I should say. Yeah. 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 <laughs> and all that stuff. It's like, okay, well, if, if you really knew like the, the genuine reason, if there was one, then you're in an area for self-improvement. Right. And then if you're, if you're in a position for self-improvement, you're never going to be, you're never going to fail. Yeah, uh, you're just true. getting more data to improve what you do. And so all the time when we get a no from investors or we get a no for something that we're trying to invest in, mm-hmm. like getting real feedback from, you know, uh, you know, unfiltered feedback for mm-hmm. what we did mm-hmm. right and what we did wrong or what I did right or what I did wrong helps us to improve for the next time. And right. then we step up back, right. back up to the plate with that feedback and, you know, go at it again. Uh, and so I, I think to me that iterative journey is, you know, on one hand, the most frustrating, but also the most rewarding. Um, yeah, yeah. And That's nothing, a good point. yeah, nothing in life, I think, is you can't have anything truly rewarding unless you go through the mud to get there. Mm-hmm. I think it just, right. I think it just doesn't exist in my opinion. Yeah. And I, and I, I'm to your point from earlier about the media as well, where it kind of over glamorizes things or it over, they over, over dramatize things. And, yeah. and when you hear about failures in the media, it's all, only really big ones, you know, you know, monumental failures that, that just, you know, plunge a company into bankruptcy seemingly overnight, right? Yeah. You know, take, take FTX as an example right now going on out yep. there, right? Yeah. Um, but there are so many little things that go on, like you said, that are small failures. They're, they're not career ending or company destroying failures, but they help to kind of normalize it and help to yeah. kind of make you realize, okay, I, I, I made a mistake here. I'm going to learn from it. I am going to become more self-aware and help out with that down the road so that I don't make the same mistake twice. I remember growing up, I know your kids are, are younger, but I can remember in my in my early teens and throughout high school, you know, my mom was a real estate agent and my, my dad was a Jack in a Box franchisee. And hearing about the challenge that they had where, you know, somebody stole my dad's payroll. He had, you know, general yeah. managers that stole from him as well and the stores. And, and hearing about these things that didn't destroy his organization, but I heard about the challenges of being self-employed and I heard about what some people do out there. But I also heard the good stories about all the great employees that he had that were partners and yep. true, you know, a huge assets to his organization. So hearing more about that as I went through my life, I think helped to prepare me for, you know, the ups and downs and the crazy roller coaster of, you know, having my own business also. Totally agree. And it's interesting to look back in retrospect to my swimming career or my military career. Yeah. Um, and, and like, I would consider almost every day that I was in the pool a series of small failures that I could iterate on to lead to a larger successful outcome. Mm, interesting. I, I don't think I truly made any breakthroughs without it being sort of a failure, mm-hmm. whether you know, tweaking my technique, uh, um, you know, improving my stra- race strategy, so on and so forth. Like, yeah, I was never, it was never, it was always, a, you know, a, seeking improvement, which means I was currently doing something suboptimally. Mm -hmm. And the same thing in military training. Like, I don't think there was a time where we had a training exercise where the training cadre would say, that was great. No no (laughs) No, feedback. I don't have have any notes for you. Yeah, right. (laughs) Yeah. It was like, hey, you guys screwed all these things up is basically how it always started. Yeah. So like, what's that mean? Like, okay, like, yeah, good. Like now I know and now Mm -hmm. I can improve. And, you know, I think in the professional context too, like you don't learn if you don't fail. Mm -hmm. And I think the the challenge is, is not thinking about it in a failure light, like, oh, I am a failure, right? not like imposing this like internally and saying like, I am worthless, I'm a failure. Like, no, like that wasn't done to the best level it possibly could. So use that as a data point. So it's better the next time. And I, I, so the way, you know, I, I think that people... You know, sometimes I, I I've done I haven't done very many podcasts, but occasionally I'll, I'll do those, and people say, "Oh, like it's all been like you know all roses throughout the career." And it's like, dude, like it's been <laughs> it's a, so not true. <laughs> I, I've wait I, I've waited through you know the you know the bleep you know I don't know okay. if this is a PG you know, you know, right <laughs> no, through, you know you, what you know, right yes, through the crap. Feel free to swing uh, away. Yeah, exactly. I, I've waited through the shit. Right. Nonstop. And to me, that's what's allowed me to be a part of some really unique things is like my willingness to wade through the shit right. at a level that I don't think many people are willing to do. Exactly. And my willingness to like put myself out there time and time again to be told no. And it actually, I think, you know, you'd think it'd get easier, but I think it gets harder, especially mm. with people that have, that have um, achieved. And so I have to constantly remind myself of this. You know, I would imagine with you, with executives who have been mm-hmm. successful, right? Like, right. you know, they want to like, 
they view it as like the next thing. If it's not a success, then it's an indictment on their entire prior career. <laughs> Same thing with me, right? Like, you know, I was a successful Olympian. I was in the SEAL teams and now I'm in venture capital. And I think I do right now is like perceived as like, you know, a, a blemish on mm -hmm. the resume. And I think that my, my trick or like, you know, the way I think about it, like the blemish on the resume is not going out there and trying it again. And I should be exactly. accepted, like expected to, you know, fall short in many ways. But, you know, over time, my, my ability to endure, um, you know, the negative allows mm -hmm. me to experience the positive. And I, I, I think I agree that completely. That's, that's really important. Yeah. And I would even, I would argue, I think you're saying the same thing also. I would argue that if you, if you haven't gone through the shitty times, you're probably not taking enough risk. You're probably being a little bit too careful. And, and granted, totally. there are different degrees yeah. and, and comfort levels with risk. I get yeah. that risk tolerance. But, you know, if, if you're not experiencing any pushback or any negativity or any failures, then you're probably leaving a lot of opportunity on the table for fear of that failure, you yeah. know, and that's, that's not healthy either. I agree. What's the right balance? Like for us, like one way we think about it is like, if it is, if, if we're investing in deals that are easy for us to invest in, then we are not mm -hmm. doing a good job. It should, we should have that right amount of resistance and our bar should be really high. And I think it's probably the same thing for, you know, job seeking and career mm -hmm. seeking. If you're, right. You know, if you're at, you know, some level and your goal is to be at the next, you know, incremental level and, you know, getting the same job maybe as easy horizontally across other places and maybe getting a, you know, a higher paying, like, right. you know, more responsibility job is, is really hard. Well, where's, where's the limit? Like, yeah. and, and, you know, how many times do you really, you know, what's the feedback you need to get from the market until you're appropriately calibrated for truly mm -hmm. what your opportunity set is? Uh, is, is maybe another way to think about it too. Yeah, definitely. And I think that translates over to the personal side too, as we talked about at the beginning. You know, we've we've tried to instill in our our kids. My, you know, our our oldest son is twenty five. Our youngest is twenty one. And you know, we 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 talk. I, I talk about it professionally, but also with them. You know, don't chase a paycheck. Figure out you know what your passion is and be willing to to take some risks. You're going to have some failures along the way, but focus on what you like doing, what you enjoy doing, and that's really kind of I think at at those ages now where they're in their early 20s, as young adults. That's the best advice I can impart on them. And we've shared with them over over our lifetime. My wife is a marriage and family therapist, yeah. and so you know my kids have grown up hearing about the good and some ch and and the bad in the world. Right? Uh, we haven't tried to shelter them from it. I know your kids are, are much younger, but I'm sure yeah. you know probably you and your wife are going to have those same conversations over the next, you know, 15 years uh, as you raise your own. Absolutely <laughs> are. And I think, you know, what, what, I, I, absolutely. And I, I think that, um, yeah, I, I think it's interesting, like not chasing the paycheck is something. And I think that obviously everybody wants to put bread on the table, you know, so don't get sure. me wrong, but I think that, um, you know, finding the things, whether or not it's a specific, you know, company team, you know, workflow that, encourages you as an individual you're going to just be a better person on the home front too mm -hmm. I, I genuinely believe that at the home front strong and be a better performer at work right and so for me i really love what we're doing because you know probably safe to say i love competing i love that i you know <laughs> I, I i i don't like losing but i'm willing to tolerate losing if i can you know improve and get better and ultimately you know win and so I think like for me, something that's like sales oriented is something that I really enjoy because it's sort of like you got a scoreboard. Um, it's challenging when you're selling a product that's you know nearly impossible to sell. But if you have something that's that's saleable, like mm -hmm. I think it's a very fun, like competitive thing for former athletes or competitively minded people or entrepreneurship in the same sense. Right, right. Or even or even on what you guys are doing in terms of like executive talent, like it's competitive. Like these, you know, a lot of these folks very have options so. and places to go, or you're competing for like the jobs for companies to to place talent and put their trust in you. And so I think there's probably a lot of similarities from like just a DNA standpoint to people that you know that like things that are more competitive, but there's also folks that are more analytical. And so mm -hmm, that's, mm -hmm. that's, you know, there's just different skill sets fit different folks. And I think that, you know, finding that, you know, intersection of like what gets you motivated, what gets you excited about the day, what keeps you as an upbeat person and, mm -hmm. you know, with a positive general outlook. And for me, it's like that competitive tension needs to be, you know, uh, you know, part of my life. And I, right. I feel so much more fulfilled by having that. 
That's great. That's great. So, all right. So, so to wrap up here then, and, and so uh, as you know, the, the title of, of this podcast is Practical Optimist because I, I use those two words to describe myself, right? So I get the practical side from my mom, the optimistic side from my dad, and there's certainly some, some crossover and blending for sure. But I, I, I use it as kind of a, a measure of balance, if you will, right? You can't be too optimistic because then you, then you wind up you know, not, 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 not seeing what's happening around you and you hold on to bad totally. ideas too long, right? But you can't be so practical that you're always taking, you know, the least, least risky, you know, path. Yeah. That's also not healthy. So I have that balance. Are there a couple words or phrase that you would use to kind of describe yourself? You mentioned competitive uh, several times, but yeah. other, other things that come to mind to describe yourself? Yeah, I don't know. I'm an oxymoron in many different ways because I think <laughs> by virtue by virtue of like the career that we're in, you have to be an optimist about the future. Sure, I mean, you sure. have to be an optimist about technology's ability to positively impact the future. And I think it's really easy to get uh, on a day to day basis with how much <clears throat> we're either told no, <laughs> pardon me, or how much we tell no to other people sure. to you know be a little bit more cynical. Yeah, um, and so I, I think that. Our challenge is to see the opportunity and to be an optimist about, you know, a positive future, but also be, be you know, centered in reality mm-hmm, for the fact mm-hmm. that, you know, building that positive future is hard. It's yeah. not easy. And so I think that your title there resonates really well with me. I think it's what our career field embodies as, a, you know, as a technology industry, as in a finance industry. I think it embodies those exact same things. Um, yeah. Maybe different for short sellers that are, you know, maybe the, uh, <laughs> you know, neg- the, you know, the, yes. the, uh, the practical negative is or whatever. Right, right, you know? Exactly. Like, you know, yeah. they, they have to go back and, and revisit their whole value system. That's a whole yeah. other. <laughs> exactly. Whole different. But, but for us, world. I think that, that that resonates really well. And I, I yeah. really, really appreciate that. No, that's great. Well, thank you. I appreciate it as well. So uh, and, and where can people find you and, and learn more about the Harpoon Ventures? Yeah, we're at harpoon.vc. Uh, we intentionally don't have a lot on there, but we're, we're generally keeping our heads down and trying uh, to support the companies we invest in and, and grow as an organization, but always looking for that next degree of hyper-competitive folks um, to, to help level up our game. Wonderful. Oh, good. Well, thank you for being with us today. It was a great conversation. We could talk for another two hours if we had the time, but uh, speaking so. of being practical, we both have to go back to our day jobs. So <laughs> Yeah, we do. Good <laughs> seeing you. Thank you. Yeah, thanks, Ken. Likewise. I appreciate thanks, you. Take, er, thank you. Thanks for having me on. This means a lot and it always available here. Likewise. I really enjoyed the conversation. Thanks so much. Thanks. Take care. All right. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.